This podcast episode is brought to you by Sonatype, your software supply chain security platform. So just head over to sonatype.com to find and fix critical security vulnerabilities. And listen, over 15 million developers trust Sonatype. So if you are looking to develop smarter and not harder in a secure way, go over to sonotype.com. Seriously, you won't regret it. Anyways, on to the episode. Afternoon podcast. Whose job it is to care about ransomware? There are two kinds of ransomware. The consumer ransomware, which is, Amy, I have your computer. Please pay, pay me five bitcoins on that. If you don't do that, your uh, pictures with your dog will be disappeared forever. This no. is nice dog, but this is, so it's, that's between you and the financial hackers. You bring up a good point that is something I never thought of before, but does Ukraine have the same kind of laws around exposure of data attack or cyber attacks and data fraud or exposure as as America does. Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, but I think uh, in a time of war, all the regulations are thrown into the basket. So right. even the U.S. will never expose. So there are so many events, especially in time of war, even a Cold War. Whose job is it to care about this then? Within the organization, the CISO, yeah. a chief information security officer. And beneath him is the guy who's responsible for the OT. And on top of that, the regulation, or before that or after that, doesn't matter. Hey hackers, welcome to another episode of the Hacker Noon Podcast. Of course, it's me, your best friend and host, Amy Tom. And today I am going to talk to Aran Fine, who is the CEO and co-founder of Nanolock. But first, let me tell you, okay, let me tell you that I went to a concert last night for the first time in three years and I almost cried because I was so overwhelmed by like the idea of being in that environment. And then I was like, cool, I'm ready to meet people and get into the culture. And then like, I got there and I froze. Like I couldn't talk to anyone. It was horrible. My extrovertism has failed me. <laughs> but um, we'll get it next time. I'm gonna make some friends. It's gonna be great. And anyways, Iran, Thanks so much for coming to the podcast. How are you today? I'm very, very well. By the way, it's Iran with an E, not with an I. I'm not the country. It's not that yes. you brought Iran into the conversation, right? <laughs> Just to make sure that we're, you're not speaking with those bad guys from the East. Fine, Iran. Very, <laughs> correct. Um, and I'm very well. Which concert, by the way? It was Jordan Rakai at Paradiso in Amsterdam. He is a UK R&B singer, artist. It was amazing. Absolutely beautiful. It was beautiful to be in a room full of people, you know? Oh my goodness, like what a concept. And no masks. <laughs> no masks. No masks? Wow. No masks. It was normal. Like, it was completely normal. And I thought, wow, it's been two years. It's been three years since I've been to a concert, but it's been two years of this. So I'm very, I'm feeling very grateful today. So. Excellent. Um, but today I want to ask you, please tell me, who are you and how did you get to where you are today? All right, so my name is Aaron Fine. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Nanolock Security. Nanolock Security is providing protection for connected devices in the industrial and energy sectors. Prior to that, I was working a little bit in uh, the Nanoscience uh, Center of the Tel Aviv University in Tsinghua in China, which is the Chinese MIT. I had three startups and I was fortunate enough to sell two of them. And between startups, I did what every technology guy is doing. I created comedy shows. So that's my background. Okay, pause. Which comedy shows? <laughs> well, they're Israeli comedy shows. So, uh, well, I didn't mention that. I'm based in Israel, I'm Israeli. So um, the most known one, if somebody wants to browse, is called The Leash. And it had about 200 episodes. And it was, all of my shows were either on national TV or on cable here in Israel. But um, was it in starting, Hebrew? It's definitely in Hebrew. The okay. only, there's some articles in English about it but it was in Hebrew, we speak Hebrew here. Um, but, uh, and we, you know, uh, some of them were funny. Some of the okay, shows. all right, I hope so, if we're going into the comedy category. <laughs> <laughs> okay, aside from the comedy, what genre of startups were you into? Um, the heavy stuff, so before Nanolock, which is a cyber company, deep tech cyber company, I was, my previous company was called Ori, O-R-E-E. -E, and that was an optical packaging of LEDs. We invented the first in the world uh, planner LED, which is a new category 
lighting. I have 22 patents um, on the world of uh, electro optics and electroluminance materials. Um, before that, I was with two s software startups. So these were the areas and Nanolock is a software company. So the category is cyber using software. But these are the companies I was involved in. Right. I was also involved in a company called Simagine that was sold to Snap. What used to be Snapchat, and that was there's a feature there of augmented reality and so on and so forth. So I was not a, a founder of the company, but I was working with the founders until the acquisition by Snap, I think, four years back. Wow. Okay. Right. So definitely in the startup world. What I actually wanted to talk to you about though is really specifically like ransomware and in in ransomware in the current day times and what we can expect, especially given the war in U the Ukraine with Russia. So first off, I want to start by asking you whose job ransom it is, whose job it is to care about ransomware. There are two kinds of ransomware. The consumer ransomware, which is, um, Amy, I have your computer. Please make, pay me five Bitcoins on that. If you don't do that, your uh, pictures with your dog will be disappeared forever. And this no. is nice. Well, he's a nice dog, but this is so it's, that's between you and the financial hackers. Um, there is ransomware or state level attacks or big financial events where you attack an organization. And the reason for attacking the organization are two either to bring it on its knees so it cannot function or to get money out of that organization by bringing it on its knees right. um, so it will not function. The war in Ukraine is a trigger for two things. Number one, tactical, Russia versus Ukraine, I can bring an organization on its knees. Number two, it's creating an act, a chaos. So what we're seeing around this is what we call cyber chaos, where everybody's against everybody, with the financial actors versus the state level actors. The state level actors um, disguising themselves as financial actors. Um, there's so much complexities and havoc and chaos around us. So ransomware can be done by organizations for financial or organizational purposes. And there's a flavor of the consumer side, which I think we'll leave out of this discussion because they just don't click on strange emails or right. limit your porn, to, you know, porn usage and you'll be out of the out of the danger. Right. Not okay. you. Being listeners, of course. <laughs> of course. So when we talk about like enterprise level ransomware then, right? Which companies right now, given the global situation or the situation specifically in the Ukraine, need to be concerned about ransomware? Again, let's differentiate between the story in Ukraine, which is companies that are related to that. So defense companies, mm -hmm. um, relatively close geographically companies, um, companies that can influence from a media perspective will be subject to those kind of attempts. Right. The second layer is the companies that are not linked directly, but um, are in the public eye now, utilities, energy, waters. So <coughs> Europe is considering the event in, in Ukraine a risk in terms of energy consumption. If I would have been a, hack a hacker, this is a very, very good time to attack the uh, critical infrastructure and energy infrastructure in right. Europe because they're more vulnerable. Right. Applies the same for the US. So I'd say this kind of an event trigger, first of all, critical infrastructure, defense, and, and media organizations around this universe. In the second layer, um, it reminds everyone that um, critical infrastructure customers are willing to pay a lot from Colonial Pipeline to anybody else. And in times of such turbulences, the willingness to pay is even arises. Yeah. So why then to date, as far as I'm aware, and you know, well, as we're recording this, it's like early April still, but why then at this point have we not seen a massive attacks like the colonial pipeline attack in Ukraine? Number one, I don't know if they were or not. So mm. not everything made it to the public eye and there's a lot of disinformation coming from Ukraine and the Russians. So I'm right. guessing there's a lot of, um, of uh, events there. Number two, there are hacks around it in the darknet. You can find a lot of traffic and a lot of discussions, a lot of utilities and uh, smart infrastructure and grid are under attack. You're using that, you, you, you're speaking about ransomware, which is a very specific kind of attack. There are other ways to attack or 
um, to have a cyber attack other than ransomware. So there is quite a lot of thing, events happening around it. Just remember, uh, there was a huge attack in, on Ukraine in 2017. So this war, which is, has casualties on the ground, started with a non-casualty cyber warfare back in the late uh, 2010s. So it's always out there. Number two, some of the, pro the protection become, became better. So the guys who are providing protection became more sophisticated, but it's an endless war. They will eventually fail. And the third one, which I found to be the nicest one, um, actually you just don't know because it's not supposed to be out there. So there are quite a lot of attacks which are what is called APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. You put them, but you use them when you want to use them. So given, um, let's take a situation where I want to attack a country. There's the first wave, I put my bad code inside and I say, okay, two years from now when the um, conflict will erupt again, I will use it again. So think of attacks not as a, I'm doing an attack now, I'm conducting mm. an attack now, I want to see results now. I promise you that quite a lot of the infrastructure in the US has already been hacked by state level actors which yeah. will wait for the right time. In many cases, the Americans find out, took it out. So it's a, it's a, it's a brains mm. game and not a media game. So who just published that he has the ransomware? A lot of this is happening either undetected or twice undetected. Undetected that it was hmm. countermeasured by somebody who found out. Right. So you bring up a good point that is something I never thought of before, but does Ukraine have the same kind of laws around exposure of data attacks or cyber attacks and data fraud or exposure as America does? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, but I think uh, in a time of war, all the regulations are thrown into the basket. So right. even the U.S. will never expose. So there are so many events, especially in time of war, even a Cold War, that fall under acts that prevents uh, publishing the information. I'm sure also in the U.S. there are quite a lot of events and cyber events, and not only cyber, that occur that are not published. Although America is very open, you have regulation, but some things are related to national security, which will never be published. Right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. So with a, an attack like the Colonial Pipeline attack, so just to maybe recap for anyone who doesn't know, and maybe also for you to fact check what I am aware of, but um, as far as I'm aware, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack was a ransomware attack on a American oil pipeline company, and they paid, I don't know, around four to five million in ransomware um, money to the attackers and it also wiped out like something like 25 is it 75% of the infrastructure of oil for like a period of time where they couldn't like the prices of oil in America soared they couldn't get oil out because that one company controlled a lot of the distribution of oil and so with that single attack they both simultaneously wiped out a lot of america's infrastructure for a period of time and also had ransomware money is that accurate number one i don't know all the details so i know a bit okay. of the details um when you say wiped out it's contradicting actually ransomware so ransomware is not wiping out mm. ransomware is taking possession it's, and releasing that it, in right. return for money so wiping out is a catastrophic event where I, destroy the infrastructure. Um, Colonial Pipeline, to the best of my knowledge, was a ransomware attack where financial part of the distribution of oil and gas was hijacked, meaning you mm -hmm. could still distribute oil and gas. The pipes could work, but the mm -hmm. billing and customer care and the things that generate money for the organization were um, were under the, under the attack. I'm not aware, and maybe this is because they haven't published, on event what is called the OT, the operational technology. The ability to, trans to transfer the oil and gas products <coughs> mm. to customers. So the ransomware was on the financial side of Colonial Pipeline, and they did pay ransomware. And I'm sure that paying five million dollars in return for um, losses of dramatically bigger amounts of money is is, um, is important. By the way, I, I to your previous question, I'm not sure that the U.S. has very open laws of um, revealing um, cyber attacks. I think you're, you know, the media is telling, speaking about a lot of things, but it's not regulated and you're not bound to, to disclose. Um, and um, Really? I yes. thought that in America you were required to disclose a data breach of a certain magnitude. 
I think you are bound to re- to disclose some of it, but not all of the information that you have. But I promise mm-hmm. I will take a deeper look. But I think there, I, I'm aware of quite a lot of attacks that there they were not disclosed to the general public, maybe to the authorities, mm-hmm. but not to the general public. And I think the right. Colonial Pipeline they paid five million dollars. They got back part of it. The financial part is uh, was a significant portion. What is what is scary about Colonial Pipeline is the word pipeline. So it's not that somebody hacked the credit cards of you know hotel. That's horrible. But people will not freeze to death if a hotel is being right. hacked, and that happened by the way in the past. That a hotel was hacked. The the fact that somebody could get to the IT or the OT of a pipeline of oil and gas indicates that critical infrastructure in the U.S. is not protected. By the way, it's not good enough. It's not protected good enough. We know that for mm-hmm. a fact. The way the attack was conducted, that's an interesting question. Was this an employee clicking on the wrong? Was that a social engineering? Was that somebody mm-hmm. from the inside? Was that a a manipulation on someone? There's so many um, questions on how to deliver the attack. But for me and for our customers and people that we speak, the fact that a infrastructure uh, provider was hacked, that's the big thing. Not the fact that it was five million dollars. That's a small yes. amount of money. Yes, exactly. And I and then to circle back, I think like why does it seem, I guess, to me in media as a North American that there are not these giant infrastructure attacks happening in Ukraine? Um, in Ukraine or in the U.S.? In so the, you, you, in you asked why right it's now. not happening in the Ukraine? Mm-hmm. I have no idea. It seems there. I don't think you will know mm-hmm. because nobody has the motivation to tell that. The Russians yeah. do not want to disclose that they can do that and the Ukrainians doesn't want to disclose that they're under attack because right. it's everybody so I don't know enough I can't tell mm-hmm. you for sure that under the umbrella of the war in Ukraine a chaos of vulnerabilities and attacks is occurring under that umbrella whether it's in the Ukraine or around it it's definitely wider than just Ukraine right yeah and so tell me more about I guess like other kinds of vulnerabilities that are being exposed from the fallout of the war well well the, the war is still going on so we're not in the mm-hmm. fallout yet there's still there's still war I think the vulnerabilities are not cyber yet it's the dependency mm-hmm. of the West on uh, critical infrastructure energy infrastructure and so on and so forth that's becoming very very of it the fact that machines and devices in that world are subject to attack so we want to be digitized we want to be connected when you're digitized and connected you're vulnerable so Israel proven 10 years 11 years back with stocks net that non-connected systems can be attacked um, we what we did with the um, in Iran, with allegedly the U.S. and Israel did in Iran with Stuxnet. But when you have connected devices and connected machines on critical infrastructure, man, you have an issue there. So the vulnerability is, is exposing itself. The second thing, ransomware is a great way to say there's money there. So if before that there was state level attacks, now everybody wants to make money, um, can go and, and find some technologies to do some ransomware attack and make money. The third one is, and this is geopolitical thing, we have a new world. We have a world where it's legit to attack another country, it's legit to attack another organization. We have chaos around us. What started from universal order became so chaotic and so complicated. The fact that you're asking me about cyber attacks in Ukraine by Russia is a normal thing. Okay, it's not normal. It's not normal that they're attacking them. It's not normal that they're trying to cyber attack them. It's not normal that uh, Belarus is trying to, you know, it's crazy. And a lot of organizations and companies and smart and sophisticated hackers are taking advantage of this, including Iran versus Israel, Israel versus Iran, um, Russia versus half of the world. You know, chaos. It's fun. We need the Avengers, but cyber Avengers and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so when you talk about devices connected to infrastructure, are we talking about like my laptop connecting to my corporate network VPNing, or are we talking about my smart fridge? There's, well, um, your computer connected to the organization is nice. That's not a device. That's you know that's that's an IT. So again, okay. somebody can do an. Your fridge is connected to the internet, but worst case scenario. No milk for you tomorrow. But change the word fridge with a smart meter. Change it with EV charging station. Ch- change it to uh, the machine that does the ping and manufacture the car or manufacture something or responsible. Right. It's called OT, operational technology. The thing is that OT became connected. is operational technology. It means something operates apart from that. So 
computer doesn't make things operate. It's, it's a data exchange. It's hard if it's horrible if it's being hacked, but it won't p- impact operation. If your fridge is impacted, its operation may be harmed, and you know what? It can turn into a hot fridge. But again, it would, it's worst case scenario, will kill your, your ice cream. But do the same or on industrial fridge. Do the same on the refrigerators of a food company, mm. and then you have a, an issue, right? Then you have a right. loss of goods for tens of millions of dollars and hunger in North Poughkeepsie, for the sake of the discussion. I don't know if they have North in Poughkeepsie, but right. for the sake of the discussion, OT, operational technology, and that's where it was exposed. This is Colonial Pipeline. It's a attack that happened many times before ransomware, but it's about to, it's almost killed a distribution of critical goods to make people warm in the winter. That's a big thing. Right. So what can critical infrastructure companies do then to solve this problem? Number one, is this scary enough, by the way? Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> I, like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> how do, how do, I, like a... how do I fix it? <laughs> I don't think we can fix it. Number one, it's, we're speaking about it. But suddenly it, it sounded to me like I'm, I'm bringing so many horrible um, doomsday events, so I, I need to lighten this up a bit. Um, look, awareness is important. Understanding, th- there are many issues, and, and connectivity is one challenge. Um, the usage of a lot of um, outsourced companies opens you to vulnerability of supply chain. And again, and by the way, most attacks or more, most things happen because of human errors. People tend to drink at night, go to work in the morning, and make a mistake. Go to machine number two instead of machine number one. So it's awareness, even before anything else. There's something called cyber hygiene that you are trying to make sure that your cyber infrastructure is protected. And to be honest, companies like Nanolo that are working under this assumption. Obviously, I'm trying to, I'm telling a story from a perception and, and with, you know, the way I see the market. But it, it seems that it's going in our direction, meaning use a zero trust, don't trust. So Nanolock is doing zero trust at the machine and device level, protect from insider supply chain and human errors, not only from the outsiders, not just build a firewall around your infrastructure, assume it was breached. So if you're assuming it was mm. breached and now it's, so vulnerability is there, by the way, it's always true. 100%, not 50, not 90, not 95, 100% of the time, somebody wants to get in, he will. That's not an issue. So yeah. there's always somebody in with brute force by in any kind, means and form. So as soon as somebody's inside and then ask yourself, how can I prevent him from making harm? And there are companies, um, there's great companies out there. Namlock is one of those companies that think we're a great company as well, that is assuming that the adversary in the OT world will always get in. And now let's prevent the outcome. And the outcome can be the right. collapse of the critical infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Now I'm even more scared <laughs> because I just get oh, okay. They're already in. It's too late. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, there's uh, there are a lot of smart guys on the defending side. A lot of smart guys. Okay. So it's a war. It's a wisdom war between the two parties. The adversaries will always win, always, because they have the advantage right. of attacking first. But there are a lot of countermeasures and, and assumptions and. and work that can be done by the protectors. So now let's go back after all that, let's go back to my first question again and say like, whose job is it to care about this then? Within the organization, the CISO. Yeah. A chief information security officer. And beneath him is the guy who's responsible for the OT. And on top of that, the regulation. Or before that or after that, doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. Um, good, good, the good. consumers, and, and again, and every employee. So don't press on, don't click on strange emails. Don't answer to somebody who's saying, I'm your cousin from Nigeria. It doesn't work this way. But this is simple. The guy that you train, make sure and protect is the CISO, the CISO, the CISO of the organization, the OT manager and the employees of the organization. Yeah, and general awareness, you say. Correct. Yeah. All right, cool. Makes sense. Okay, hopefully we can all remain calm, cool, protected, and chill. Uh, <laughs> thank Green you. Water and, and take a towel. Like in, yeah. um... <laughs> and don't click on malicious links. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All right. Amazing. Ron, thanks so much for joining me on the Hacker Noon podcast. If we want to look for you online and what you're working on, where can we find you? www.nanolocksecurity.com or Aaron, E-R-A-N-F-I-N-E on LinkedIn and you get all the information. All right. Great. 
Thank you very much. If you want to find Hacker Noon online, don't forget to search for Hacker Noon on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you want to look. You can find more technology stories and information on HackerNoon.com. And for now, stay weird and I'll see you on the internet. Bye, hackers. Hacker Noon Podcast.